on this episode of the Make Ideas Reality podcast. I remember straightening a lot of nails when I was a kid. The best you can hope for in a business is that every project you love and you keep, you keep wanting to do that again. That's when you know you've got the mix right of like, it makes you money and it makes you happy. We want something different and you look like you've got something different to offer. So come in for a meeting. Whoever it was was chucking out these skanky old lines was like, I cannot believe you've turned this, these bits of timber, it doesn't even look like there's anything there, into this epic pair of lights. Hello and welcome to Make Ideas Reality, the podcast. This is a podcast dedicated to everyday creative heroes making their ideas reality that wouldn't necessarily get their story heard. I hope to inspire you with their stories, give you courage to leave your comfort zone, think big, and be the badass creator you were meant to be. I'm Justin White, aka The Garage Avenger. Let's do this! Hello and welcome to the Make Ideas Reality Podcast. Today's guest has received many accolades. BBC's Money for Nothing had him pegged as a jack of all trades. His journey has not been smooth with many ups and downs. With a big breath and a shot of vermouth, he has swallowed his pride and faced the truth. Welcome to the show, Ollie Allen. Hello, thanks very much. Good to be on. Now, Ollie Allen, uh, we met, of course, uh, like every story here at Maker Central. And we, I don't think we spent a lot of time together, actually. I think it was kind no, of. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think the main reason why I stayed in contact with you is after I started this podcast, I got a lovely message from you, and yeah, I, and I thought, oh, this guy's really nice, and his work is great, and so I sort of started following you a bit closer, and then we started talking a little bit, and then I said, all right, well, it's time now. It's, it's time to get 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 him on the show. Yeah. So here we are. So it just shows you Amazing. people, the DMs work, <laughs> if you want to come on the show. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, so I thought we'd start a little bit with who Ollie Allen is. Okay. So yeah, I'm Ollie Allen. I um, am a designer and a maker. I'm based in Sheffield in the UK. Um, and like you've said, Justin, I've been on a journey, I guess, over the past 10 years of working for myself ups and downs, highs and lows. And um, yeah, and most recently, the past couple of years, especially kind of going to Maker Central, I've wanted to create YouTube videos, uh, filmed loads of projects and edited like three or four videos. So, you know, I'm not, not as accomplished at the, putting the videos out there as some others, but uh, that's, that's something I want to get, you know, more of in the future. Um, yeah. Now, I when we started talking i was kind of, i sort yeah. of got like dragged into your story and and i thought there was a lot of value here so this is, you know i thought i'd give you the opportunity to tell people your journey and and where you know your creativity all started and then where you yeah. are at now so okay. off you go <laughs> yeah so um i guess as as a kid i was always creative and building things, making things and, and drawing. Uh, I remember, um, you know, growing up in a family, in a family home that we were renovating um, at the time. So there's always things that were kind of like falling apart and we're building back together. And, and my dad would be renovating things, building skate ramps in the back garden um, and kind of generally being hands on building tree houses. I think there's like an awesome picture and I've just checked it out. It's on my, on my Instagram feed part of the way down of this brown tree house that we built out of loads of scrap wood, painted everything brown, but I must have been like four or five or yeah. So me and my brother were really young and my dad had just set us off on this crazy project, um, just nailing things together. I remember straightening a lot of nails when I was a kid. Like <laughs> it's brilliant. Just like reclaiming nails and like hammering them flat and straight and then using them again. Um, and that's kind of taken me on a journey towards studying design um, 
and I remember going to sort of uni, it was either, um, I guess it was more media and video production or design and making. And I did, I did design at, at high school and kind of didn't do so well in the first year. And then a good teacher, she kind of transformed my passion for it. And I, and I got an A in, I think, GCSE. And that kind of showed me that if I put some effort in, um, things can happen. Hmm. And then went on to study design, product design at uni. Um, changed the furniture design part of the way through. And, and yeah, um, I think that's, that's been really valuable. Um, we were saying in a brief chat before that you don't realize the kind of skills you get from design teaching until you've kind of had that. And you maybe compare working with someone else. Um, I've done like projects projects on building sites and other things where I've just assumed someone knows how to either sketch or draw or work something out and, and forgot that maybe that's a skill that I've learned and built on over the past, like, you know, 10 years of schooling or whatever it is. Um, and so, yeah. Um, and I guess keep rolling with my, uh, with the whole story then <laughs> from start to finish, shall we? Yeah, um, let's do it. It's yeah. So I suppose I studied, studied design, um, and came out with some projects that were semi-functional. I built a table and, and a few other bits and bobs, but I was focused more, or I suppose, um, I could see looking back now that my, my attention span was like quite quick and I wanted to be building things and get some prototypes out there and then maybe make the next thing rather than sp say a couple of other students were spending like, six or eight months on this one project and they're realizing the design and going through all the stages um and then maybe draw it like a hundred times on cad um whereas i just needed i used 3d design packages as like a method to just quickly sketch out and figure out if it was if sort of almost possible um and use it for sort of material quotas and then think, right, okay, I've just got to get making because that's really where the, um, the problems are solved. Um, and I built on that skill. Um, and I was able to use the sort of design packages. Like I, I can draw things in 3d. I'm not amazing at it. Um, compared to say other industrial designers. Uh, but I used that to, yeah, to get the, get the, um, message across so that either somebody else can make it or I can then explode it a bit later on and figure out exact. Um, I guess this is probably what a lot of people use SketchUp for now is to show the customer or show somebody, oh, it's going to look roughly like this and then they agree it and then you can work out all the maths and the things behind the scenes afterwards. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. Moved through uni, got a degree in, in furniture design and then set up a design business, a sort of product designers with a couple of other guys. And we were 20, 21, 22, literally hadn't got a clue how to run a business. Started in the uni's like incubator, business incubator and got maybe like 500 quid towards setting up this new business, um, which was like loads of money to students then when you just have no money. <laughs> uh, but back now it seems it seems like an interesting kind of budget to start on if you're trying to start a business um but it was yeah it was money and we used it for sort of cameras and other bits and bobs to go towards our processes as designers and and some tools um and yeah we worked on some cool projects some interesting stuff um as a kind of as a three of us trying to figure out um nothing as technical as your arduinos and stuff but um i wish i'd had a bit more in sort of information or, or knowledge of electronics back then. Um, but anyway, we, we built, built a few prototypes and built a, th a couple of client projects. And then we found it after about maybe a year, maybe even a year or two that we, it was pretty tough trying to trying to actually commercially make money uh, against the big boys that were possibly doing it for f sort of five or 10 years. And so I went, went my separate way and, and started a, I started to look around and I'd, I'd always done sort of renovations and building projects. And that took me on to starting a property development company. It was kind of, we, we basically bought a house at auction, this massive five bed house that was destroyed. Um, and I'd said to you before that it took 
we, I, I almost did most of the jobs myself. Things like plumbing, electrics, roofing, and um, plastering. That was all kind of handled by friends of friends and recommendations. But the joinery, the building, all sorts of aspects, I kind of gave myself an apprenticeship by just thinking, maybe it was like naively thinking, oh, we can definitely have a go at this and do this. And it's great because I got stuck in. Some things took way longer and were way more complex than they should have been. If, obviously, if you know what you're doing, you could just bang something up in 10 minutes, but uh, it wasn't that easy. And so I kind of gave myself that apprenticeship that you'd probably get working for another firm over the, like a couple of years. Um, that first project took twice as long and cost twice as much money uh, as it should have done. I thought it'd be done in like six months and I think it took about a year and a year and a bit. Um, and yeah, so that was kind of an interesting learning curve and I, I flowed on towards some building projects and always had an element of wood in there because that's, you know, sort of easier to grasp for me maybe. Um, and then I went on to start my own uh, woodworking business and that's when I, I almost started off just doing anything and everything. It was kind of like fitting doors for a local company in in town that were renovating a big building and just friends of friends passing on the word of mouth and picking up like pallet wood kind of seating and and some cafe uh, jobs to fit out a couple of cafes and it sort of kept building from there um and yeah and i, and I built that built the business up um doing all sorts and then thought, right, I'll, I'll fancy going towards the furniture side of things. And then I guess I looked more online and, and that's when I maybe started posting things on Instagram um, and, and showing people what you do. Cause I guess that's a method of it's now how you tell other people what you're doing. Um, yeah. And um, for you, for probably two or two or so years, two or three years I was running that business and um, and I wanted to expand my skills. So I ended up doing anything and everything at the start. And then I think, right, I, I want to spray some, some cat. I want to learn how to spray paint. So um, I would, there's a, a sort of wardrobe door project that came up and I was like, yeah, totally. We'll spray that. We'll do that. It's moisture resistant MDF spraying it. How hard can it be? We've got a compressor and um, yeah, looking back it's one of those things that took me like a week to learn how to spray and then we sprayed it and I had a friend Andy helping me and I had to pay for his time for like about a week to help move the boards and cut them and sand them and spray them and install it all and then actually the install process was not the one day that I thought it was so for a project that's like 1500 pounds it took like two weeks worth of our time plus all the materials and equipment for like 400 quid and I didn't make much at all. So I, I thought I was doing it for sort of the benefit of the building the business and paying my way, you know, pay the materials and pay my way. And then I'm skilled in that area. So then I can mark it as that we can spray doors and we can spray projects. Um, but I feel now analyzing it, it, you know, it doesn't make business sense. So I was making these decisions back then probably from like a passion and a um and an interest point of view and being like i really want to learn that skill uh but but financially if you're reading like a profit margin or a balance sheet or something it'd say um you know something's going weird on this computer it's it's series but actually writing down what i'm saying um what like, <laughs> the computer just popped up and most of the things that i was saying just started writing down on the list. So sorry, it distracted me. That's um, super creepy. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. Um, if, as if I'm not using the microphone for one thing, it wants me to use it for another thing. It's a strange computer. Um, yeah. So, so th this, like, so you had a business that failed in yeah. the beginning. Well, not, I mean, did it make money? The design business with your mates? Um, I guess, well, probably not. Like it wasn't, it definitely wasn't enough money for us to, to live a life that we wanted. Um, you know, it, it was, 
it was kind of it, at the start it was tough and then we were getting some money in and we were paying ourselves but really to go any further than just like living a student-ish lifestyle it wasn't enough say that I, that we wanted in a comparable design business and maybe we were looking at it um you know it's tough you have to you have to kind of strip out potentially this is one way of starting a business is you strip out the the fancy things in life and we didn't really you know we were students so we didn't have the money to spend on big things or or um but we didn't have the responsibilities then as well so we didn't have things like mortgages and and other responsibilities so we could do that and and maybe then when we tried to make the next step up or i wanted to make the next step up it was kind of like a, a turning point where i was like actually this just isn't we, we didn't have a plan of action for the amount of money we had to make per month or per six months or per year to then figure out how much that would pay us. We kind of just winged it and then, you know, couldn't quantify where the business was coming from, <laughs> which you learn how to do. But it was one of those moments where I was like, uh, you know, we, we, we'd been at it for a while and I thought it's best to just try something different rather than try and keep going slogging at it for a little bit longer and being a guest like unhappy or being not necessarily as happy as we could be yeah and you, then you go into property development you know and you and yeah you buy this property and then you know yeah you you realize that it's a lot more work than you you're capable of doing it by yourself right so definitely yeah that, um you said you said in the pre-podcast though that you had, you end up yeah. making some money on that. Yeah, we did. We I think I, I spent twice as long um, and spent twice as much, but we still made a little bit of money and and you know a bit of profit. So I had some money to pay me for like another sort of couple of months afterwards, and that was great. Um, but then, basically, I guess the the thing the pot from the investor dried up, and and we've spent it on other projects. It had gone to another renovation. And so I couldn't quite repeat the project. So I thought I'll diversify and go into building and, and sort of be, um, I guess potentially what we needed is like maybe a couple of, couple of other investors on board or we needed to just, the timings kind of weren't right. So I thought, right, I'll go into doing business, uh, building and, and sort of joinery side of stuff and being a building contractor. And then that brought its own kind of difficulties, I guess, unless you have, not lots of subcontractors and other people that you can just pull at a moment's notice. Then I found scheduling jobs in was really difficult because, you know, if something overruns, your electrician goes off to do another three weeks worth of work. And I'm like, Oh my God, I can't finish this job because of, you know, that reason. Yeah. And then if other subbies came in and you know, they, they were busy or they didn't get the job done in one day. Cause I'd anticipated it'd be a day or two's work hit a problem or a, like a, a bump in the road and then they're not back for another three weeks. Whereas you can't really do that to a customer's house. If you've started pulling it apart, it's just got to be in and out. Um, whereas with the renovation project, it was just like an old battered house that it didn't matter. It kind of did financially cause you're paying for it to borrow the money and you're paying for the, the loan and stuff mm. and all the other overheads. But really that was kind of minimal in comparison to just finding the right people to do the right job um i think i've had a go at it again now it'd be more dialed because obviously i've been through that process and i can see how other people um have done made some furniture for a couple of property development guys and you know they've got to have everything scheduled down to the like hour and the minute and cross over like we've got the decorators finishing on that day and the same day they finish the carpet fitters are coming in so it's a different beast to just having a go and that's why yeah but you, had, you had to go at your own woodwork business as well. I mean, yeah. you talked a lot about the the things that kind of went wrong, you know. And yeah, what were what were the highlights? What were the what were the awesome oh, there's stuff? some there's some good projects. Like I think the the outcome uh, and I, and I have the kind of the fun and the the enjoyment of the completion of these projects. So like I, I with that the um, cabinets that we sprayed, they looked awesome. The finish was great. Um, I was really happy with it and I was happy that I'd accomplished that skill of sort of spray painting and using two part paints and figuring out all that stuff that seemed like 
um, seem like unknown to me and impossible, but it isn't. You just have to figure it out. Um, and one of the best, I think my, the piece that, well, it will go on now in sort of to be, to outlive me as a, as a furniture maker is a reception desk that I made for an art gallery in town. And that was a piece where I'd just probably done the same thing as I did, you know, how we got in touch. And I sent a message to, um, the, the museum. Uh, I think it was millennium gallery. I actually got married there. So I should probably know that. Um, we got married <laughs> in this awesome modern gallery at the top. Um, Jess, yeah, so I, I hope sent you're him... not listening to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, forgot everything about my wedding and my life. Uh, it's been a busy, hard six years or so. Um, <laughs> Shit. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's brilliant, isn't it? Um, so yeah, I, I sent him a message and was like, hey, um, I see maybe I'd got into a, like a, a government or a council procurement website and it was like, we want X, you know, joinery firm to fit like, 20 toilets and shower blocks in wherever want to do this want to do that and, and it said like the millennium galleries or museum needs uh internal fit out works and so i just messaged them saying hey have you got a contractor in mind and they were like yeah we've already got this sorted but i'll keep you on file like a year later i got this email saying we want something different than your average four mica box that like a typical big joinery shop out you know shop fitting firm would do because they just have big panels and they glue all the four mica stuff to it and it's it's really good it's really utilitarian and just kind of it works for museums where there's loads of kids hands and sticky fingers and other stuff mm. probably not in this time now but you know back a year ago when you're allowed to touch things yeah um so um he you know the guy who was the kind of purchasing manager maybe he, he'd said we want something different and you look like you've got something different to offer. So come in for a meeting. And it was amazing. I, I'd, they'd just done this sort of semicircular sketch of like, here's a rough place in the entrance hall before we had this red box on the right, which just looked like kind of a passport control or something like a little red box. And you just go and see someone who is miserable, hates their life. And they just like, yeah, information. Here's the toilets. Here's there, go away. And they wanted something to be really welcoming. And they are a big part of Sheffield. There's a, it's like a thoroughfare from the station and there's a couple of escalators and you can take them up and you can make a shortcut. So it's like a daily commute for hundreds of people. Um, this is a really special piece to be there. And, and we'd come up with this semicircular design. I came back to them, built a little cardboard model of kind of like a slatted um, stacked plywood um, ribs, I guess, they are we built it all out of ply big curved thing with a black black valka mat top um and that was something that i'd figured out calculated the budget it was like a seven and a half thousand pound project and that was the biggest amount of money i've ever written down on a piece of paper for something made out of wood hmm. um and before that we were kind of doing yeah i was making cabinets and other bits and bobs and doing like say installing some doors and building some reclaimed furniture and doing things that were maybe two thousand pounds max you know and that was mostly materials and a bit of time so this one i thought i calculated all out it's going to be about seven and a half grand and they said yeah we love it that's fine um and i was just that was great so that was kind of a turning point in the business where I was like, okay, I can get somebody else to cut this, these components out, or I looked into getting a CNC machine. And so it made sense to, at the time it made sense to get my own machine. So I, I did that and I bought my own CNC machine. Um, I bought it on finance and it sat in the corner of our workshop and it got installed and we cut all the parts out. And that was great because I could experiment, I could play, and it got me into the world of CNC. Um, and maybe the price tag for cutting something like that out from a subcontractor would be like a couple of grand. So I thought we can do it for obviously less than that. And then I can use the machine on and on and on. Um, and that was probably about three years ago. I've had, I think it was about two and a half, three years ago that I had the machine since then. Um, and this, this piece of furniture, we completed it and it looks absolutely awesome. Um, I think there's some pictures I might repost it on online. Um, so it's higher up, but it's like, yeah, probably about two years ago. And that is great because friends and family have seen it and been like, this is amazing. This piece is brill and it'll sit there. I'm pretty sure as a, 
I think they're a charity organization, so they're not going to go ripping it out anytime soon. No. And I've already shown the kids, but it'd be cool when they're, you know, another five years old and they're like, they're 10 and we go into town and they see a piece that I've made. That's really special. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely been some high points, like really. And that's, that's, um, I guess part of running a business is there's some, sometimes that it's going to be tough and you hate the project you're doing and you finish it off and you're like, wow, that may not have worked out. And then the, I guess the good, the best, the best you can hope for in a business is that every project you love and you keep, you keep wanting to do that again. And that's when you know you've got the mix right of like, it makes you money and it makes you happy. Um, and so going along the lines, um, we've talked about it before and, and it just, it wasn't that simple. It wasn't. So that project, maybe I can't remember the maths on that, but you know, it was a successful piece of furniture, but because there was learning involved in a machine investment, I don't, you know, I don't know if I made great, great money on it, but it kind of paid its way. Um, and I saved money by using our, our own machine and mm. that I can use in the future. And that was good. Cause that brought in that opened the doors for CNC making and manufacturing. Um, and I guess I even, and we didn't really discuss this in the, in the pre-pod, but I set up an, a separate sort of business. The idea was to run um, a separate CNC business called cut house. And it would be its own entity that I could kind of grow and I could potentially have that as a separate thing to like Ollie Allen as a furniture maker. And it did work. I put a, I put a, um, a website up and uh, got some Google ads on the go. And although it was really tough cause I found lots of, uh, lots of people coming in emailing me saying hey can you do this can you build this um and i need this shelf cut and and it's like a bit of a triangle shape um and i'd say yeah okay minimum order is about 45 quid because it's going to take half an hour to an hour to to draw it and make it and service that person correctly yeah. plus the material and they were like oh i was hoping it would be like you know 10 quid and, quid, and we what, said what are people retarded you know, or something jesus Christ. yeah they just like thought it was just the corner of a bit of plywood but then they almost forget and they don't see that because they can buy like a quarter of a sheet from wix or b and q or any like hardware store yeah and they can pay like 12 pound for that they just assume that they're only paying for that 12 quid whereas you've got to buy the whole sheet and you've got to have it sitting around and you've got to take the time out to do that so that's why I guess bigger, say laser cutting firms and other people have like a minimum order of 60 to a hundred pounds. And that'll probably pay for one guy's time for like the hour plus making some money on it. Yeah. So yeah, I got like the mix wrong in terms of what I was promoting and loads of people hit me for like plywood furniture. And so, or they'd want it really fast and I wasn't really geared up to do really quick turnarounds because I had other projects going on. So I think the, what people want from a CNC business is to just email you that day and be like, I'll pick it up tomorrow. Or you can, you ship it like next day delivery and you've got to be a certain type of business to do that. And I just wasn't set up for it. So in the end, I kind of wind wound that down a bit and just left it alone and thought, okay, if people want CNC stuff, I'll go for some projects that are worth it. Um, but yeah, trying to figure out the adverts to cut out people that are just like, Oh, I need this. I need it for tomorrow. And I've got a budget of like 12 pound 50. Well, you know, you say that because the interesting point is when I worked as a furniture maker, right? Yeah. Uh, we, we were right next to a, a sawmill. Yeah. And the sawmill had a sign saying mm. sawmill this way. And people would take the journey down, trundle down the road. And then they would yeah. see, they would see that there was a like a furniture maker right next to it and then yeah. they then they'd come in and ask the stupidest questions yeah. and ask for the stupidest jobs that would never ever make us money right yeah and, and used a lot of our time mm. and with the the owners of the um, the furniture making workshop yeah i i didn't understand it in the beginning when i worked there i was like why don't you have a sign saying like furniture make yeah. it this way people come in and and well, then i realized because yeah. majority of people are kind of retarded when it comes to that sort of stuff they don't <laughs> yeah. they don't have a clue yeah and they think you can just make it for nothing and yeah like totally. they, don't, they don't understand that you've invested like for example in 
our workshop, we had invested millions in yeah. big machines that totally. cost huge amount of money to maintain and run. And yeah. they didn't, they didn't take that into the pricing or anything. Cause yeah, I mean, they're yeah. not their responsibility as a, as a customer to, to think about. Yeah. They that, just, but. yeah. And if it's a specific, I guess like a sort of, they do a bit of DIY and so they'll probably, they, they want something in their house that's like a square or, you know, whatever shaped piece of material, but they haven't researched into the, the making of it and they don't quite figure how say like the next level would be a couple of steps up is like makers like us that have got the tools in the workshop and we know that it costs, you know, a couple hundred quid for a good set of saws and other bits and bobs. And you then, so you can't possibly just cut out a little square of timber um, and they're just walking along the road thinking, well, if, if the hardware store can cut me out like a rip of a half sheet for 12 quid, then these guys surely can do it. And if you're working, like you said, on like 50,000 pound kitchens, there's no chance you've got enough time in the day or value in that job to just rip a bit of timber. Um, yeah. I mean, people yeah. honestly just came, they just wanted things like run through the joiner and yeah. run through the planer and they would bring green material. Yeah. And they're like, we can't do this. <laughs> awesome. It's a, yeah. you know, I'm going to do this for you. And then it's going to be like a banana in about two yeah. hours because it's too you get great. it back in your house and then like two weeks later it's just like a complete useless piece of wood uh, it's split yeah. off. people just didn't understand and so yeah. i mean they, i mean that's also a problem with societies because we are majority of society don't work with their hands anymore so they don't yeah. understand that right this yeah, that's thing true. is about working with wood right like when yeah. our grandfathers probably knew probably that yeah. more than what our generation does for sure so yeah it's i guess like yeah the the um the like vernacular i guess it is that's a good word i learned at uni the materials are completely different our vernacular materials that are close to us are manufactured boards they're kiln dried woods the things you can get down the stores mm. and they are technology in computers and things whereas back in the day it was like you'd like we live in an old converted church that was built in about, I think it was 1876 and the beams are huge and they would have just, it puzzles me to think, hang on a minute, like where did they get this huge length of wood from? Yeah. They would have just chopped down. It's all this old, really old pitch pine. And like, guess where you are loads of loads of big timber framed structures and buildings. And they just knock down a tree and drag 10 trees to the place and then sit them on top and make the roof structure. And they had to just, do that and learn and understand it because otherwise they didn't have houses or they didn't have towns. Whereas I guess now, you know, you can do like precast concrete things and just drop it all into place. So people, they just don't have that grasp of making their, they're quite far removed from it, from the physical aspect. Hmm. Um, I'll, I'll never forget to like, someone brought like they came with their trailer and everything and they, they said, yeah. I've got these slabs of Oak. Like, can yeah. you, can you like, can you make a table out of them? And I said, Oh, I'm going to have to get my boss. And then yeah. my, I don't know what my boss was thinking. I think he was drunk. Yeah. But he said, <laughs> yeah, he said yes to the job. And Sweet. the twist over two and a half meter plank, the yeah. twist in it was 12 inches. Amazing. The, the twist. <laughs> like, you can't There's get no wood. chance. You can't get any wood out of that. You'd have like a little piece about this big that's flat. Hey, um, I don't know what he was thinking. I think he was honestly drunk. Was that anyway? But I so how did it end, turn out? Well, we end up what we'd end up doing is cutting it into strips. Yeah, we yeah, I suppose. Yeah, but that's not what the, <clears throat> that's not what the customer wanted. <laughs> so he wanted like a huge raw he wanted a tree, a live edge table. That's yeah. what he wanted. Yeah, uh, but we couldn't give him that. So, yeah, uh, it's, it's a yeah. very interesting, you know, like the reality of running a business and yeah. dealing with customers in, you know, 2020, you know, yeah. is very different to, you know, maybe 30 years ago. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think, I think it's um, very interesting. Um, mm. I want to talk a little bit about uh, BBC and the Money for Nothing. Okay. Um, yeah. How did this all happen? How did you end up being on telly? <laughs> so 
Uh, I guess this is it. Like we, the, the, the start of our um, podcast, we've said getting to people's direct messages and just sending it, getting yourself out there does work because I'd, I'd followed Sarah, the host of the show. Um, and, and so like the original series started with just Sarah and then they've expanded a couple of extra presenters to get more projects in and to do more cool stuff. And so I messaged Sarah and was like, Hey, I think I could be a maker. And so she said, yeah, we'll put you in our like waiting list of makers. And then nothing happened for like a year or so. And then after one night I'd had a couple of beers and they just messaged the, the money for nothing team. And I was like, I reckon I can give you guys a run for money or no money or money for nothing or some like really ridiculous pun. Uh, and I just said, no, but I'm being serious. Like uh, I've won a couple of awards for what I do and I run a cool furniture making business. Check out my Instagram and, uh, and, and have a look. And then they message back saying, I'll talk to the team. It sounds really good. Uh, let's, let's have a chat on FaceTime. And so uh, the producing team gave me a call like a week from then and, and had a look through my Instagram and, and the pictures I put out there of projects. Um, yeah, we got on pretty well and they kind of edited like a mini video, I guess, you know, a, a sort of snippet of me telling them about what I'd done and some pictures of projects. And then they sent that further up the chain to the BBC dudes and they were like, yeah, he sounds, he looks good. He's all right. He sounds cool. So let's have him. Um, and then it, it just kind of went from there. And, and the next thing I know, um, the like producer director, one of the guys with the cameras, Michael, he was shooting me making stuff in my workshop in the city center. Um, and, and so, um, the pro the program, if you haven't sort of seen it or if people aren't familiar with it, uh, it's on BBC one about quarter to four sort of daytime back end of the day TV, um, money for nothing. So the idea is a presenter goes to a local recycling center and stops like, interesting things being chucked away and they say hey excuse me can we have that and if we make um anything good with it we're going to sell it and whatever profit um that they get back from from say me as a maker charging them to to renovate it or to do something to it they'll give that profit to the original person who was chucking it away um and sometimes they don't sell things i think like one of my one piece didn't sell but most of them did and they made some good money on them and uh, and and yeah they'd go back and the people would always be which is pretty nice like I tried to make the pieces of furniture not look like the original object that was being thrown away um, so then the reaction from these these people throwing things out was really great to see like they were just amazed there's one lady I think I'm just trying to remember which which one it was um maybe so the first project was probably the most exciting one and because that's obviously my first piece that i did it was turning some old slatted blinds made out of thin beach like the kind of ones you get in ikea or anywhere um so i ripped them into strips and i've actually got i've made the youtube video of that because at the same time i filmed like me in the process making it so it's one of my four or three or four videos i've got online um made them into these onion shaped lamps with steam steam bent the wood nice red cable and a nice lamp in it um and and that was great the the you know whoever it was was chucking out these skanky old blinds was like i cannot believe you turned this these bits of timber it doesn't even look like there's anything there into this epic pair of lights mm. um and they went they got sold i think they went to either an interior shop who were going to sell them on or it was like a um like like a meeting space or something so it was in like a community place where a lot of people enjoy them hmm. um which is really good so that was all down to me putting myself out there and kind of shouting about who i am and what stuff i'd done um and so yeah that was great and, and overall i think i've done about 10 or 12 projects um yeah 10 or 10 or 12 pieces of furniture and I think before the uh, the whole sort of pandemic hit, I was due to go uh, live with maybe one or two pieces of furniture. But we had this briefing at like four o'clock in the afternoon in March where my time slot got cut out because they, they uh, you know, they'd put the news out that like lockdown's happening on the Monday. And I was scheduled to be on the TV on the Tuesday, but then there's like a news briefing. So who knows soon I'll be on TV. Uh, 
with a brand new episode, but then they, they repeat them as well. So uh, I've had a couple of friends from school. They saw it on like a Saturday afternoon. And they were like, hang on a minute. I went to school with this guy. He's a designer and I, I'm sure I recognize him. So they messaged me, which is pretty fun. Hmm. Um, yeah. And uh, we talked about it before, but it was like a project that, well, I wanted to get involved with it partially because, you know, being on TV, every, everyone, not everyone, but I, I fancied that I show people what I do. So TV was a great opportunity to show other people what, what I did as a maker and as a, as a business owner. And then also um, the projects had only a finite amount of material. Like they turn up with these two blinds and you have to make something out of it. And for, for all my other work, it's been like, okay, you want this thing making, well, that'll just be like 10 or 15 sheets of plywood or whatever it is. And you can just keep ordering more material if you cock it up or if you, um, if you use it all, you can just order as much material as you want. Whereas these projects are literally, you've only got that much material. You've got to think really hard and be really creative to come up with something good. Um, and then I, like I said before, I always wanted to make it interesting, put some modern furniture influence in there. Cause that's my kind of style and my take on it say traditional craftsmanship and joinery and, and wood joints. That's something I have not got into a lot of. Um, and, I, and it's about, I suppose, more the modern aesthetics of furniture. That's where I focus. Like, um, just because if I was making things out of plywood, it can be made in whatever way it was made, but it looks kind of modern and funky. And so creating something out of these blinds or this old bit of oak or this kind of old, there was one that was great. It's like an old workmate and some old boy in his shed had made this one fold out leg and he'd cut a hole in the middle. So this circular saw screwed to it. And it was like the most death trap com sort of thing you've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. um, and he'd taken the circular saw out, but I could see exactly what he'd done. He'd like rigged it up. So there's like a push button switch and he'd made this mental table saw that, maybe it was for like firewood or for just one job and he's throwing the top away. So there's like two big beach blocks of wood and some steel legs that we turn into two cool little stools and they were quite a straightforward project. So that was one of the more simple ones, but it was, it was good to be using that material um, and transforming it into something that somebody else would love. And I think that's, a, we were saying before, it's a big trend now because it's sustainability and the way the world's going, but also as a maker, it's a good way to get some like free or cheap material that you can then have a bit of a play about with. And if you ruin something, you think, okay, I'll just chuck it in the bin and, and get some more of this free material um, or low cost material. And it's a great way to get started into the, into the making scene. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, that was a fun part of it that you can show people, what you can make from relatively rudimentary basic materials, which is quite a nice, a nice thing to do. Well, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because, you know, I got a comment not long ago on, mm. on my soapbox car build. Now yeah. I talked about that. I found all majority of the, the materials in the, in the bin, right? Yeah. In the trash. I found most of it in like a, like a yeah. skip from like, what do you call that in, like a giant, like a container. Yeah, yeah, a big at a, skip. Yeah, at, um, at a workshop. Yeah, right? a drag, drag. They were just shitty, you know, pine two by fours. Drag yeah. most of them out, and then I built this beautiful 1920s style soapbox car, right, out of this. Yeah. And this uh, person commented on saying, like, oh, you know, it's all right to say, you know, you can find materials like that anywhere. Uh, you know, you don't live in like I, I can't remember which country she lived in. And I'm like, yeah. Um, is it illegal to ask builders for scrap material in your country? Yeah, and definitely. She's like, no, like, Mike. Well, well there then, you go then. Then there you go. Right? Then just do it. And yeah, that's. I think that's been a big part of my life, like skip diving, and my friends, and and when we're working together me and a couple of mates from uni when we started this design business i was always bringing home like random stuff and they and at uni as well friend i think i brought a bathtub home <laughs> this could yeah. be my story my, my ridiculous you know the, the joke story but i i'd 
convinced another uni mate to just help me drag this bath home and because you're in a in a city there's loads of renovations going on on different streets of of all the houses stripping them out and making them into more student student houses so there's a bath sitting around maybe it had a few beers or maybe this time i was completely sober but just totally crazy like normal and uh <laughs> I was like, yeah, let's take this home. I definitely want to make some seats out of this bath. And then we got it back and it sat there for like a couple of months until one housemate threw a stone at it and like popped the bottom of the bath. So it was almost useless. But my plan was to cut the center out and then build like a steel or a wooden frame and you have two armchairs. Um, yeah. I think a couple of people have done that. And maybe there's another guy who's done that and turned it into like a chaise long and kind of... Um, yeah, so that was a project that was going to happen, but I convinced these these flatmates who were like doing completely non-design courses they were like well, what on earth are you doing why would you want a bath you're, you're an <laughs> idiot um but yeah i'd find like chairs in the skip and um i think i had a chair only up until about two years ago where we threw it away so it's like it was probably like 10 15 years old when i found it not even that good a chair it was like just a corner office chair and i kept it for another 10 years so i gave that thing a new lease of life the cat loved it. She slept on it for like years. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that's, there is material out there. And so I've kind of merged this, this um, personally, I guess my, my, my design and furniture making passions have merged from like modern furniture to then also really loving to find random things that people have chucked out that is trash to them. And thinking hang on a minute that's just good material but then i reckon as a maker and you know meeting loads of people at makers central and and then getting immersed in who is who's who and finding more friends uh, through instagram like you know have done yourself and a few other people to us as a maker that is just access to great material it doesn't matter that it's someone else's trash that you know, and that was a big thing. Like maybe growing up as a kid, you're like, oh, you can't touch that. That's, that's rubbish. And probably sensible that my parents said that. Mm. But there's this, maybe there's things going on in society that are like, oh no, you can't, you can't like just that's rubbish. Once it's gone, it's gone. You're like, no. Yeah, well, the, it's just scared of what other people think. Cause you like, oh, they might yeah, think I'm totally. a bum. Yeah. I'm picking up rubbish, you know? Yeah. Taking stuff out of a skip. Whereas now I'm like, literally can't help myself driving down the roads looking in skips like even if i've got more wood than i can ever imagine and i've not got the like you know even if i've already got that stock of timber or i've got enough bits of old doors that are coming out of my ears um i still like just look in just just to check um just to see what's about there and i will give some advice because i've jumped in a lot of skips and <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and I would I would give it some advice. The advice for jumping, or I like to call it dumpster diving. Yeah. Um, you know, Skip if you're gonna diving. go, yeah, if you're gonna go dumpster diving, find the person that owns this uh, owns the yeah. skip, and go ask them, introduce himself, and say, hey, this is what I do. Um, yeah. Can I go through your skip and have a look what you got? And am I? Can I take some stuff out of there? If yeah. If I'm allowed. That's the and safest ma- way to do it, isn't it? Majority of people will say yes, but if they catch you jumping in their skip without even asking, then they get angry and then you become the you know, the weird person. Yeah, that- it is weird. There's like a, a psychology behind if someone's chucked it away, and maybe even I get the same. We've got a skip at the moment for bits and bobs of like and it, it's a good thing to throw in stuff away. I've been a hoarder for many years <laughs> and there's some stuff that's totally rubbish. Uh, and there's other stuff that's definitely material waiting to happen um but yeah if someone's thrown it away then they almost don't want anyone else to have it and they're like hang on a minute so you can get some people who are really funny and like no you can't be taking that and you're like well why you're just gonna give it to a guy who's gonna take it away in a wagon and then burn it or crush it um but yeah as long as you ask people that's like totally they're usually happy to well what i see as is it if you let someone take something out of your skip then you've got more money's worth of skip to put more of your trash in 100 percent. so it gets it emptier quicker that's um, right that's right yeah it costs money to have those skips and empty them definitely for, you know and they they're done per ton too so yeah you know, um you have, to, you have to think about that so that if they if you can take stuff out of there they're usually happy but i think my advice would be yeah. to ask about it 
yeah definitely that makes sense hmm. um i want to go talk about where you're at now because i think that's an interesting thing that yeah would be great to share with people if you want to share that um definitely. so yeah so where are you at with your business now so in terms of woodwork business um as of pretty much january time i have said no more wood no no more woodwork because it's been a a, like you say up, ups and downs it's been a pretty emotional like roller coaster of highs and lows um and a, and of sort of successes and failures of, of running this business and so right now um i'm concentrating on making stainless steel wedding rings um for mine and my wife's business which is this brand sheffield steel rings and so we kind of launched that rebranded it and launched it in about march time um, just as all this pandemic hit and went online and it's great. And I, and I, and we're getting lots of orders for amazing wedding rings. Um, and then I helped Jess within her jewelry business, fine sort of precious metal jewelry. Um, and then kind of backtracking from that, um, I've been making these stainless steel rings for maybe the past four years or so. Um, when I just taught myself how to make them because Jess had a, a sort of friend or a subcontractor making these stainless rings and she came home from picking three of them up. The people were getting married like within a week uh, and a guy who, who makes them for us, he was away from, for work for a month and Jess basically got home and then lost these rings. And she was like, Oh my God, I've got these customers that are getting married in like a week and I've just lost their wedding rings. What can we do? And James was away for a month. So I was like, okay, I'll just have a go at making them. So I just bought a massive bar of stainless steel and then we bought a lathe and I just stayed up for like a couple of days and basically nearly set fire to the cellar a lot of times. Uh, <laughs> and, and in like our wet cellar, it's just like damp floor. I was stood on a couple of crates and boxes of wood, not really got that deep into metalworking, especially not engineering kind of style metalworking. Mm. And I just made some and cut some and drilled them out and did it. And then we kind of got hooked. And then I perfected my skills and my techniques and, and we've kind of gone from there. And so the past three years or so, Jess has been offering them as a part of her customers. But then this year we decided to just separate it completely as a different brand. And that's what I'm kind of leading at the moment um and so yeah um that is where i'm at at the moment but uh, i was doing it all alongside my woodwork job so i was running this woodworking business and kind of coming home and making some rings in the middle of the night um because i just couldn't fit the work life balance in properly and i was saying yes to woodwork jobs where they were and not really understanding if they were profitable or not so i guess over maybe it was three years or so of woodworking business. Um, the, the kind of getting more skills, doing more projects and doing different projects every time started to wear away at me because although I was gaining more skill, I was doing a different project, which if you're trying to run any business kind of repetition is the key. And especially in woodwork, that's why like when you worked in a big woodworking workshop, they had the massive table saws and you've got the capacity just to keep pushing boards through yep. and then you can pick up more work for big board pushing jobs. You know, you cut all them up and big shop fitting firms as well and joinery shops. They do the same sort of stuff over and over again. And then they might upgrade to like being able to spray the doors rather than just paint them or send them out to a painter. And so I took the view that because I could physically do everything I should. And that was literally the biggest mistake in business. Um, and I guess that just thinking about it now, that is like a strong thing for me to think back. Um, and I've learned that over the past three years, but I kept going and going. I was like, it'll be fine. I'll make some money somehow. The next job will be more profitable and the next job will. And the reality was that I was doing some cool stuff and I was putting it out there on the internet. Um, and the customers were happy with the jobs, <clears throat> excuse me, but it was that. The bottom line was that it wasn't as profitable as I needed it to be. Um, and so I wasn't really that happy. Like I thought that it was maybe even since, since going out on my own 
eight, 10 years ago as, as a, you know, as a sort of self-employed person, I thought it was depression and I thought it was bipolar and I was suffering and I was never happy because even though I was doing these cool things, I could never get the mix right. And it always seemed to be really stressful. Um, and then it was like late 2018 when um, a friend had suggested we speak to someone who could give me some sort of counseling and some, um, some therapy. And it turns out that this therapist, her son had ADHD. So she's had like 20 years experience of seeing what somebody with ADHD looks like. And she's like, Ollie, I think you have ADHD and it's just been undiagnosed. And that was like a big eye opener. And the more we looked into it, the more that it fits because I probably said earlier in the podcast that at uni, I wanted to do like one project and move on and then do another project and be like quite quick fire. And a lot of makers and creative people probably have the same thing. Um, and whereas you see the other typical student, you know, the odd few ones that I've got in my head, they would sit on a project for like eight months and mm. just make sure that that was going to go like almost to production. Whereas I wanted to be like the next week on another project. So all of these, all of these realizations of like why my life was so tough. It's just, just like, it just like read itself out in a list in front of me. And I was like, Oh my God, this makes sense. I'm not like destined to be really sad and really angry at myself for the rest of my life. Unless I've done something stupid, you know, it's plenty, that's, that's understandable. Um, but there was this, it was an eye opener and it really helped me move forward and think, hang on a minute, this ADHD diagnosis allows me to understand how my brain does work and not try and just beat myself into a position such as running a business where you have to do, you have to be like almost your own accountant, the bank manager, you have to figure out the money coming in and out. You have to invoice people and sure you can, you can, delegate this to other people but you have to get there at the start and you have to put the hours in and make the money to then be able to pay for other people to do that and when you when you're you know your own person it's really tough to go from one and jump up to the next level of say like an employee um and i just sort of in that moment maybe a couple of months realization and the more i learned about it i realized that actually that, that I wasn't the right, I wasn't set up correctly to be able to do that successfully. Um, do you think it's like to do with the, your uh, personality, like finding out really who you are and how you, you function made you realize, oh crap, I'm not necessarily yeah. set up to even run a business. Yeah. Know, I, I like thought this. that, I thought I can do this. No, it's me. And, and like we touched on, you know, it, it, talking about ego and, and, and even though it wasn't ego, it's like a greater feeling that you think I have to do this and carve my own path. And the way to do that is to fund it with client money and a business and, and be a business that will then pay for this, you know, uh, kind of collection of tools that I want to do and then this work that I want to achieve and these skills that I want to gain by making things and doing different yeah skill work um and then understanding that yeah me personally I could separate that that want to do things and to gain skills and to be accomplished and I could separate that from making money that way and for years I'd never thought that was possible I thought that the only way to do it was to just be within this business. And I was like, hang on a minute, how can business be this hard? Um, and on and on and on, I'd kind of come home and it, I'd be working late. You know, we'd work around the clock or I'd then put in deadlines and be like, yeah, it'd be done in two weeks and other stuff flies in the door. Or I'd say yes to other things thinking I'll take a day on that. So it won't affect my other big deadline. And it was totally everything just kept crashing in on me that everything meant I'd have to work longer hours or it cost a bit more money or I'd have to get a friend in to help, which would cost more money. And so when this, when I'd been diagnosed with ADHD or I'd begun that journey of figuring it out, I was able to see that that my brain 
would let me take on other projects when I already had like 37 and a half hours worth of work. And I'd be like, oh, I'll just squeeze this extra one in. It'll yeah. only be a few hours. It's kind of like this podcast. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I thought I'm, in, I'm building the craziest in thing in my garage right now. Let's yeah. start, a sofa, let's start a podcast on top of the sofa. Bit. Yeah. What a great totally. idea. I, people learn new skills. People then, were ribbing yeah. me on Fools with Tools um, page the other day yep. about me taking two years to build this thing. And I'm like, you motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah, that is so harsh. <laughs> <laughs> so nasty. That's oh, brilliant. It, it's, of course, it's all in good humor. But, you know, like, yeah. um, I think for you, I, I find it's really interesting because, you know, letting go of like all this hard slogging work you yeah. were investing in this, you know, you yeah. invested nearly 10 years of your life doing your own thing. Yeah. And then yeah. there's you, you didn't really tell the people, but your wife's telling you like, you could just work for me. Yeah. You could just work for me. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't I've got my yeah. thing going And so on. roughly around the time, like early 2019 is when I was understanding what my brain was sort of way the way it was wired and and a lot of people like on ted talks and there's a, a girl of like how to adhd i think her name is uh, on on youtube and she runs a load of amazing videos so there's a load of resources out there that um that I was learning how an adhd brain is wired and that is you know completely different to the standard brain and i was kind of understanding and it made sense. So all this time, maybe the year before 2018, where I was taking on these projects, which kind of got more grandiose and bigger and bigger. And a couple of other friends were like, wow, he's, you know, someone who's in, in, in sort of like Oak framing, we took on an Oak framing job and, and mate Tom said, good on you. Like you got, you got big balls for trying that project. Cause it's not easy. And I was like, yeah, well, you've got to do what you've got to do to make the money. Looking back now, I'm thinking, you know, probably like a bit of stupidity, a bit of luck, a bit of a lot of um, sort of positive attitude of being like, I can get this done. But then there was a lot of work and a lot of late nights and a load of kind of like over or underestimation of time. You know, it took, the, took about the right amount of hours, maybe a couple of days extra, but it was like saying I can do something in two weeks when, because the customer wanted it in two weeks when it really should have been like a six week project and just yeah. done proper chilled out rather than actually doing it in like three weeks, but work in till two in the morning. Mm. Um, and you can only do that for a certain amount of time, but it kind of got to the point where I was doing that more often than not. And then like you say, Jess would say, this is not sustainable. And, and almost at that time I was so engrossed in my own, in 2018 in my own kind of this is going to work i'm going to make this happen i'm going to be successful i just couldn't hear those advice points from friends and family it's mainly family because it's hard to tell friends what you're doing and you're like oh you look busy i'm really busy yeah it's successful yeah it is and then that's the end of the conversation and so, so 2019 sorry, God, sorry. I, that's interesting because yeah you know like on social media, we post all the pretty stuff, right? Yeah. So, you know, like I look at your Instagram and I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is really cool. Um, yeah. And then, you know, you're telling this story and behind the scenes, shit's falling apart. You know? Yeah. And, and that's things... what a few people had said. Um, mm. A few friends have been like, wow, but you're doing so well. You know, you're on the TV, you're filming for this. Um, you know, like your Instagram story, you look like you, you know, all the pictures you put out are quality work and they were, they were, you know, and, and I want that to be, I wanted that to be my business that is high quality products and, and work that were put it out there. But yeah, when you're a business, it's really tough. Say if I'd have started out on this journey, just as a maker, like, Hey, I'm in my back garden shed, which like now I am, I, and we've built this workshop. I'll come, we'll probably touch on that a bit later, but I built the workshop to be able for me, it's almost like a mental thing as well as a physical, you know, it is a physical state and place to be is that workshops just for me. It's like for making and it's not for customer projects. Whereas at that time I was like, I'm a business. So a business has to put out that you're successful, you're reliable, you're people going to pay you thousands of pounds to do something. You're not going to 
disappear or cock it up massively. And if you do cock up a bit, then you just suck in the costs and pay for like another new thing. And that will happen in business when you're doing new things. But I didn't want to tell anyone you can't, you know, you can only tell a couple of people. And so when some friends are like, Oh, you're doing really well. And you're like, well, yeah, I am, but it's not converting into a profitability or maybe B it's not just like making me happy enough. Um, and so that's allowed me to kind of think about it this year, you know, this past year or so has made me think more about, um, and then like going back, you were saying friends and family, like Jess was saying to me, just, give up woodworking it's not profitable enough and you're maybe not wired enough uh, wired the right way and i'd figured out that my brain wasn't wired correctly to do all of this crazy multitasking yeah. um and juggling and so about march time i'd kind of gone into the workshop and had a guy working for me and i was like it's just i'm it's just too much i just can't do this anymore uh, and it was obviously a shock to both of us, but then I was just like, and I almost for maybe three months just didn't even really go in to do woodwork. I had the workshop in town, couldn't really do it because I couldn't face it. I couldn't mentally get up the strength to say, go in and finish off the projects. And then it kind of got later in the year and a couple of people were like, are we going to do this? We, we've got a renovation. We need this like bathroom vanity unit making. We talked about it in April. Are you going to make it now? It's ready in like a month or so. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So I like forced myself back into finishing these projects off to get, because I'd taken deposits or I'd like, I'd committed to things. So I did it, but it was quite tough. And I still had those late nights. Well, I think it's um, probably because you were facing reality that, you know, you knew this yeah. wasn't actually for you and going totally, in the yeah. shop, going into the shop was like, yeah, the ego hit like, you're like, fuck, yeah, I'm going to close this. Yeah. Thing yeah. Down, it was right? tough. Um, and then there's still like the balance of like really wanting to do a couple more money for nothing projects, but then actually like paying the bills. Cause they obviously, we shoot them over a couple of days. Um, and then it takes me, you know, a couple more days extra. And so there's like more time invested in those than there is like monetary value when we say how much it costs over the show and that's kind of part of it. And I knew that was, but I didn't have a business strong enough to allow me to take that time off. You know, if I was making big profits on big jobs, then I could pay my way for a month, you know, or a couple of weeks and then take a week off to do that project. Yeah. But it wasn't strong enough. And so that was a battle. I was like, Oh man, I really enjoy this. And, and, um, but I just can't get to it. And that was like a real big realization. Um, and there was some highs because there's like to the back end of last year, there's this co-working space that I fitted out and working with the guys at desk space um, who are my customers, but they're also like collaborators because they, the three partners have all invested into these co-working spaces and they wanted someone to design it like kind of properly and, and, and they loved my style and they've invested in me. So that was like a positive to it. I had like my final projects were really good work um and i and that was great but it was still the tough kind of like oh my god i've got to i've got to put that time in and mentally be there and go back to the workshop and then and then i got rid of my workshop in town and from like january time i finally after jess asking me to work for her for like 12 months um i've, I've i came on board with her and we've been able to grow the the, the stainless wedding ring business because I've been on board and I've got the headspace for it. Um, and we've been able to do other things and I've been big, but, but also probably because I've shut the door on the old stuff and I've shut the door on the, the debt and the, the bits that were like still kicking me in the ass, like paying for a workshop. And anytime I thought I could make some money, it would just be taken out of one hand, like given in one hand and taken out the other to pay for the materials and the other stuff. And it just, there was no, it, it got to too many, um, you know, annoying kind of things going on like that. Like, Oh, I've got this money on this job, but it's just gone to pay for this other job. And, it, and it's, I think yeah. it's the reality, the real, real yeah. uh, sorry, the reality of running a business. If you're not the person that is capable of doing that and you have to be mm. honest with yourself, you have to yeah. be self-aware enough to say, yeah. I am capable to do the work. 
and yes. I'm capable of doing every aspect of the business in the beginning, at least, right? You could, yeah. Unless you, unless you got buttons of money behind you, you're gonna have totally, to do yeah. everything yourself. And, and without having a big, big pot of cash, like I started off just doing smaller jobs and getting bigger and bigger and bigger, hmm. and that's an organic way to grow it. But I needed a buffer of some money, and the the profits just weren't giving me that buffer. And like you say, me realizing that. I'm, and that was a really big battle going through it. And maybe that's, you know, and that's been there for the past eight years or so. And that's why I've kind of felt depressed and low and trying to figure out what this emotion or this psychology was, was that I'm skilled and I love making and I love creative problem solving. But every time I did something, it was, there was just no, like, there's not enough high there to keep it going. It was always like, you've done that. Cool. Right. Get on to the next thing. Next. Yeah. And I was like, what on earth? Like, why is it so hard to like, is it so hard to be happy in this industry or this job or this, you know, I work for myself. And then I'd kind of counterbalance that with being on social media and being like, we've just done this awesome project. I get a buzz over it. There'd be some cool, you know, collaborative chat about it. And then, then it'd die off because, you know, the next reality had happened. Yep. And with me understanding that I am a skilled maker and I, and, and I'm allowed now, like I'm, I'm allowing myself going forward to make things that really, that I've got a, a passion for and in a sort of to pay the bills wise, uh, we've got a business that the business side of it, there's someone else there that's helping me, you know, Jess and I run it collaboratively. She kind of master plans it. And then I create and I'm the maker and the photographer and the kind of, you know, all the bits in between. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a great, we make a great team, but beforehand I didn't have that teammate because, you know, it might not have been her, but it, it could have been a partner. It could have been someone else in the business, another mm. director or another partner. Uh, and that's who I needed. So, um, yeah, I realized that without, with just me, I cannot run a woodworking business, just me, um, for all, for sort of all the physical and, psychological kind of the way i'm wired reasons yeah um, i mean that's the truth you know and you go yeah. facing the truth is the hard thing yeah now totally. but what's what's in the free what's in the future are you just going to keep on making like you know you've built your workshop in in your shed in the backyard and you're just going to make for for joy yeah so that's the plan like i looked at and then we dis we discussed um you'd ask me the question of like what did i think of you as as who you were from say social media from online presence and and i saw someone who likes making things and has adapted their way of living and working to help them do that and there's there's plenty of my friends on instagram that do that and they make because they have the job that pays the bills and then they make things um in the evening times or around that and so <clears throat> i've kind of got like a, a combination that i enjoy making rings and that gives me like a stimulation of making something and completion but then also going forward it's going to be my shed's going to be the place that i've always wanted it to be which is like a big even just a big open eight before sheet of wood that if the kids need something building i can make it for them and if we've got a chair that's fallen apart i can just feel like i've fixed it and not have to do it like in the corner of the kitchen or something like that yeah, just have yeah. a equipped space that um or like if a friend up the road wants something cutting or drilling or screwing i can be like yeah cool bring it around and we'll have a beer and do that um and that is what i want and so i've worked on that that idea um and and you know being sort of a, a i guess posting posting my journey um has helped me in ways that um I've, I've been able to, as long as well as money for nothing, I was kind of doing tool reviews for professional builder magazine and I, and I got friendly with the guys, the editors there. And so we've worked on the shed as like a kind of sponsored project and they've got in touch with a couple of material suppliers and I've, I've, I've built my dream workshop, um, which I've, I've basically got to make a couple of YouTube videos and I have been doing, I've been filming everything, but they've offered to, um, if I write some, some articles and we review their products, then they'll chuck some products my way, which has been amazing. So I've kind of got like windows and doors and some loads of OSB from Norboard um, 
that like has been amazing. It's helped me transform my own personal space um, to allow me to do that more to like maybe collaborate and to be how we see these bigger YouTube stars, you know, they'll, they'll kind of collaborate with brands. And that's something that's still, um, still on the horizons for me. I still want to be a maker and a creator and a kind of content creator, but for the right reasons that I like doing it. And if I collaborate with brands say that, that give me something back and that we both, um, we can both do something together, then that's, that's the right reason. Um, and there's a lot of people out there, you know, the big YouTube stars that are getting paid to do what they love and they've kind of merged that, um, the client is almost their viewers as well as the brand rather than the client is Mrs. Jones up the road. And I thought it always had to be Mrs. Jones that wants some cabinets making. Whereas there's this new client that comes about, which is kind of like all your friends and people who are going to, you know, not so judge you, but they're going to review you as, as who you are as a maker and how creative you are. Mm. And then also the brands that you'll work with that will support you, but then also yourself as a creative content creator. Um, and so there's that, that, that is a potential kind of like client base or um, reason to make things rather than somebody up the road asks you to make a table. Can you make it? Yes, I can. Or you've got to do it and it's got to be this much money. Um, I, I think it's a much better way to look at it. You know, me personally, yeah. I, I can't run a business. I know I'm, I'm not, I don't have the right personality. I don't have yeah. the right, my traits, you know, and structure to do so. And that's, and living with that reality is the truth, you know? Mm. Um, so. I think it took, took a long time for me to figure that. And, and I'm happier now that I've realized that. Yeah. Um, and they realize that there are st things that I do not want to be doing. Um, and that's, yeah, I got wrapped up in my own world thinking that I just have to be, it has to all be me. And that's not true. You know, you, you build like the biggest companies, Amazon and everyone have networks of teams of people that do, you know, some people just do one singular job, which is, yeah, that's it. That's how businesses grow. Um, and looking at yeah it's tough to kind of figure that out when you're in the moment and you're like I just need to get more work and that's it and that's not always the right right way to go about it I think this this is really a great journey you've been through like highs lows everything you know realizing what works what doesn't work and now realizing yeah. that you're not the person you thought you were and then just yeah being, moving forward and yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> I thought let's let's continue the the rest of the podcast and let's let's get into yeah. story time. You got a oi, you got a story to tell? Um that is a good question. It's got to be a funny funny story. Uh we went we touched on skip hey we can just jump straight into inspiration nation if you don't have a story yeah i was gonna say we touched on uh skip diving and bringing back a bath um that's something that comes to me to my mind fun um yeah I, i'm like pretty sadly i thought i was a funny guy but it seems like funny stories are not not hitting me tonight that's <laughs> <laughs> so good man well this i mean this let's be honest like the the podcast is kind of serious tonight you know like talking about yeah realizing that you weren't the person you are or thought you were yeah. and, and and that's the truth yeah. but your work you know your work is fantastic and i would encourage you guys to go check out you know ollie's work and i wondered is there any sort of everyday creative heroes that inspire your work yeah yeah inspiration nation uh. Uh, uh, uh. yeah there definitely is and um this this kind of like like me and you and being at maker central maker central is like you know it will be for a lot of makers the start of a lot of great journeys and 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 conversations um and i think someone like really close to home is tim from turgworks like he'll we'll chat and 
have met you know back and forth messages and it'll be about just you know the kind of i've been pretty honest with him and said to him you know woodworking hasn't been all it's been cracked up to be and he, he kind of had that reaction where i was like oh i thought that you know i thought that um it was great and successful and like yeah and so i told him my story but then we're both just chatting about making things and the passion and enjoying making things and he's someone who loves to get in his garage and he's like you know he's renovating it he's he's, he's building desks and re and restoring tools and uh yeah i think he's, he's definitely worth a check and he's really funny as well he's got some absolutely amazing humor like i'll get destroyed on some comments that i put i was wearing a pink shirt one day and he just he just destroyed me um, <laughs> and it just, it just made me laugh and smile and like now I've got to check which shirt and what color I'm wearing and whether somebody's going to make a comment. No, I'm joking. Like that's part, part of the, the connections between people. And, and I guess um, someone who's really um, skilled and creative um, is make it Soph. And she is, she's a, an amazing Welsh girl and she is just, she's a great portrait artist and she's kind of on a journey now where she's experimenting with with painting and she's uh, but then she also at maker central she's worked with with the kids and kind of made created workshops to inspire children and young people and i think that's mm. that's absolutely awesome like i love trying to get our kids involved in stuff um and i think that's where you can make a big difference is getting to kids young and saying just make stuff and just have a crack and that will shape them as makers of the future, which is brilliant. Um, so there's, yeah, a couple of people for everyone to go and have a look at. If they don't already know them, then give them a shout and say hello and say great job or give them a thumbs up on their posts because I know it will mean a lot to them. Yeah. I, I think Tim, uh, he's awesome. And make it so lovely yeah. as well. It's really, I think, great people to shout out. I don't think they've been shouted yeah. out on the show before. I think I've shouted yeah, out. Cool. I've shouted out Tim for for doing the um, uh, for the, draw, the drawing. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Corona time. Um, what was it called again? Like throw down. Yeah, was that, that was one. it. Yeah. Like a drawing every day, and yeah. I didn't get involved because I can I can sketch. Like we've said before, I can sketch pretty well, but I'm not a fine artist. So uh, uh, yeah, but yeah, he's he's a good guy. Really funny. <laughs> um, let's go into hack attack. This is Hack Attack! I will not apologize for this bad intro. Any tips or tricks you want to share with us? I reckon, um, and for ages, uh, so, so I've wanted to make more YouTube videos and I've filmed tons and tons of hours of footage, uh, even to the point where like, the, I was making a little OSB kitchen with Carmen in the back garden, a little four-year-old. And I put it all into iMovie and it's like an hour of footage. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I can strip out loads of it because it's been me filming or I could speed it up. But I've realized that if I use places like Fiverr or online kind of VAs and personal assistants, um, a couple of people have quoted me like 60 quid to, to chop all my video files together. And I'm thinking that could be a really cheap way because it was taking me like eight hours ago to just even get a rough cut of a video. Mm. And then I get really frustrated. I'm like, oh, I've got all this amazing footage that I just want to show people. And well, they'll figure out if it's amazing or not. I think it's amazing of me making stuff. And I've got that footage and at the moment it's just sat there on hard drives and I'm like, okay, well I can afford like, you know, 60 quid a month. I just got to spend that money. And over like six months or a year, I can have my videos that I wanted to publish. Um, and it's a way of helping me out if I haven't got the time. So I think, and I, for ages, I've been the same old Ollie where it's like, no, I've got to do every single thing myself. And I think you can be the same. I know you in, said to me, you involve your filmmaking as part of the process. And I think that is true to me to an extent, but also I've shot like wide shots and sort of close-ups and then I can do the, the voiceover. So I'm thinking, why not have a go? And if, uh, if the results are rubbish, I've spent 60 quid and I could get a video that like maybe is okay. And if it's crap, I've spent 60 quid and I've had a go. Um, you know, and you're like eight to 10 to 20 to 30 hours or whatever in the plus. Yeah. 
right? Totally. Yeah. And I can, I can either a take a rest that I need to do, or I can, you know, take some time out or I can focus on, or I can just manage that process. And like we were saying before, maybe take it as though I'm a business owner and just delegate out a few things uh, and then see what comes back because yeah, it's worth a go. Uh, and I could save like three days of my life and I could do other stuff and I might get a result, which is probably going to be as good or even better than what I can do. Cause they are professional video editors, but they're just based abroad or somewhere else. And I think there's, you know, there's loads of other platforms, but I just went on the other day onto Fiverr and thought, let's have a go message two people. And they said, 50 or 60 quid and I was I was really surprised I was thinking I'd have to pay a friend for like five days to do it you know but it, that's not the truth so yeah. that is a hack in my life that I think I'm going to explore more um, and see where it takes me because I hopefully will be surprised and pleasantly surprised yeah cool all right let's yeah. go into rapid fire five hey what are you looking at get up and dance this is the Rapid Fire Five. You ready? Yeah, go for it. All right. Creativity is? Uh, creativity to me, I guess, is solving problems and trying to do it um, like quickly, probably. It's, it's about testing your brain to come up with some ideas uh, and just solve some problems and use what's around you, like, you know, tape and glue and nails. And I love that idea of running around and making something. To me, it's physical. I guess creativity to other people could be drawing and other stuff. But to me, it's like cobbling something together and making a prototype or doing a job. Yeah. What's something people get wrong about you? Uh, maybe it's that I've got this amazing successful woodworking business behind me and that actually, um, you know, I, I, I find it tough to make things as well as other people. And, and I'll ups, that's maybe one thing that I didn't touch on is I'll obsess over how to make something way more than I need to. If I just get stuck in, I can do that. So I think, yeah. Um, and that's the, the plan is to just open it out a bit more and, share what's going on behind the scenes as well as out the front. Yeah. Good. Um, favorite film. Good question. Uh, what am I always quoting? I always like throw out random quotes and nobody, few people know what's going on in my head, but just like me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. Uh, favorite film really tough. I don't know. It's got to be, some oh, no i can't i can't base my life off one film uh it's <laughs> got to be like damn it i'm rubbish at these uh, quick fires you wanted something snappy and i'm like it's not gonna happen um quick let's put it out there favorite film no it was he doesn't probably, have one <laughs> yeah no i uh yeah i reckon no, I'm, I'm lost, man. Sorry. I'm rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. All right. Uh, what does your everyday carry consist of? Um, pretty boringly. It's like my wallet, which has got, if the kids haven't removed it, my cards and my driver's license, and then my phone and my van keys, which has got like shed keys or had a workshop keys. Uh, and then if I'm going for a wander out with the dog, it'd be like a dog lead and maybe like a little, um, sort of an opinel or a flick knife or something like that. Something that's probably, I'm hoping it's legal to carry around here, but, um, well actually probably more realistically, my everyday carry, if I'm going anywhere is actually my van keys, which then relates to all the stuff that's in my van. So usually it's like drills, tools, about 15 fleeces and jackets, hundreds of different random screws. So I'm going to extend it to like my everyday carry slash travel is a van full of random stuff that I think I can fix weird stuff with. So yeah, there we go. I'll let you, I'll let you off with that. Yeah, that's cool. That's good. It's a big <laughs> shed that's on wheels. <laughs> and uh the last one what does happiness look like 
Um, happiness looks pretty much how it looks now, actually. Um, it looks like getting creative with work, but also getting paid for work and for jobs. Um, and then doing things in our house, like um, we renovated a church five years ago, six years ago. And then we kind of like forgot about it and just cracked on with life. Yeah, we've had a couple of kids and, and then the businesses. And I was so engrossed in my business and trying to make that work that even just like putting some skirting boards back on that was annoying me. And like I was able to find the time, probably at the wrong time, but I just smashed up the bathroom tiles in the floor down, down here um, in the downstairs bathroom. I just smashed the, fl- smashed the tiles up and then relayed them. And that like having that time for me, for little projects that makes me happy, that is, that is happiness combined with making sure my family is kind of looked after and paid for. And yeah, um, it's, yeah, that, that's pretty much happiness for me. Awesome. All right, let's wrap this up. Um, is there anything you want to leave the audience a uh, takeaway, maybe a saying or something you live by? Uh, sweet as a nut. That's what I say quite a lot of the time. Uh, that's a saying you can take away from me. I'm going to try and put more of my comments and my personality out there and stupid sayings on, on Instagram for people to take away. But yeah, I reckon it's, um, like understanding, um, where your mind is at and that it might not, that, that might not be like the final diagnosis in terms of thinking, um, uh, you know, you feel low or you feel depressed. It might not be just as simple as that. It could be something different. Um, and, and just doing a bit more research and, and talking about how you're feeling. And this is all, you know, the sort of everyone says, just talk about mental health, just talk about it more. Yeah, it's not that simple because when you're in the dark place, you're in that dark, bad place and you don't really want to chat or you don't know how you're going to be received. But I think doing a bit of learning, talking about it, and and then it allows you to be honest with yourself and kind of and not be so hard. Like for, for so many years, I've been hard on myself thinking, why am I so bad at this? Or why am I good at some things, but I'm such an idiot at this? Like, can I not get it right? Whereas now I'm trying to learn to just let it go and say, you know, some things just don't always happen. Or if so-and-so expects that of you, that's their opinion of you. Just let them be, just leave them alone with it. If they think they require something of you and you can't deliver it, you're okay to just say no thanks and walk off and crack on. And for ages I'd lived by like, if someone wanted me to do something, I almost had to because they'd ask me to yeah, and that just drives that, you you're worried yeah. what they would think of you if you were they maybe totally they yeah were unable to do the job yes and you didn't have the skills to and do so. yeah and if i was thinking i was more like oh my god can i do that job yeah probably it'll, i'll do a bit of learning on the job but i could probably do it but if i said no then that would definitely but in concrete in sort of set it in stone that you couldn't do the job and then so i was like okay my mind says it's better to say yes and do it but in reality it just is not at all and i feel happier by saying no to certain things um who knew the simple letters no could be so good for you and powerful right yeah definitely yeah that's it powerful as well where can people find you ollie so they can find me personally on at ollie allen on instagram and then our um sheffield steel rings Instagram page is where all of our amazing Sheffield steel stainless steel wedding rings are. Um, and we're growing that hopefully hoping to make it international. Uh, we've sold quite a lot in the UK. I think one guy might have bought it and then he's moved to Australia. Hopefully there we go. But I'm thinking if anyone wants a wedding ring and wants me to make it for them, I'd love to send it around the world. We want to, we want to spread our a network of amazing people who, um, have one of my rings that I've made here. Um, so yeah, that's at Sheffield steel rings. Um, and that is where you can find me mainly on Instagram. I did try Facebook with mine, but there's just not enough time in my life to manage too many platforms. Hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ollie, thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey. I hope uh, you guys have all 
gotten something from this I, like i think there's a valuable lesson here for people is just stay true to yourself and like sometimes it's hard to know who yourself is until you go through some shit and work it work it out definitely um so you know for, i would encourage anyone that's like kind of hitting walls right now or feeling a bit shit about where they are to look inwards and understand start, start looking at yourself and maybe what you're doing is actually not meant for you right if you keep on hitting walls no um, bless you yeah you, you might need um you might need that so yeah I, i'm i'm still here ollie <laughs> all right sorry i lost you for a minute when it was you you know you're talking from the heart there and i didn't hear any of it <laughs> um i want to also thanks everyone for listening um before you go uh, follow ollie if you haven't already um if you want to support the show um i really would encourage you guys to tell a friend um or you know if you want to support me um even more you could create a shark tank pitch and pitch uh to the sharks to invest in this podcast um or uh <laughs> you could build a signal jamming satellite to jam all other podcasts around the world and only play this podcast on an endless loop of all its episodes. Um, if you want to give me some feedback, you can reach me at Garage Avenger on Instagram. I would love to hear your feedback. Um, please let me know. Please go check out Ollie Allen on Instagram and all the other places, Sheffield Steel Rings. Uh, the links are in the show notes. Until next time, keep pushing yourself. Keep ballsing up things, keep learning, get inspired, and I'll catch you on the flip side. <laughs> there we go, we're out.